welcome to everybody. First, I want to say thank you to our presenters. Um, you know, it's it's always a big ask when you when you ask somebody to to put together some slides and attend one of these. So I definitely appreciate it uh, that uh, people are are willing to help us out and uh, share their knowledge. Uh, thank you to the Ross Industrial Consortia. Um, there are three of them now. Uh, one in in the Americas, uh, where I am, and then in Europe, and we're just starting one in the Asia Pacific region. So uh, they support uh, these kinds of meetings and they support members. And so I wanted to thank them. And I also wanted to thank the participants um, because without your interest, we wouldn't do things like this. So I really appreciate it. On to the agenda. So we have some really, really good speakers. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to, to hear what they have to say. Um, they truly are experts when it comes to ROS and, and uh, continu continuous integration test and deployment. So um, I'm really excited to, to hear their presentations. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Ian from Rethink, he, he uh, had a la something last minute come up. Um, so uh, we'll have a little bit more time for other presenters. And um, uh, I do, I, I, I am a little bit sad that we're missing Rethink because uh, I really think that they could have, have brought a lot when it comes to actually deploying a product um, and doing software updates and maintenance and those kinds of things. Um, so I might ask some of our other um, other presenters questions related to that because I, I really felt that's what Rethink was going to bring. But uh, needless to say, we have a, a great list otherwise, um, and I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let um, as we go through the talks, we'll we'll introduce people individually. But very excited about the people who are presenting. Um, just some promotional things. Some upcoming events. We have some Ross Industrial Training here in the States, uh, February 13th through 15th. There's a, a link. Um, if people are interested, uh, consortium members, please reach out to us um, and uh, we can talk about the, the, the value of training and, and, and the, the cost that you might have. Um, also, there's going to be a developers meeting February 14th. This is an invite-only meeting, um, but uh, it's really meant for people who have a genuine interest in, in Ross Industrial and, and, and actually contributing. So uh, if you have that interest, please reach out to me. There's my email there, and uh, I'll, I'll definitely uh, I'll, I'll send you an invite, and we can talk about it. Um, but uh, this is a little bit of a reboot of previous developer meetings, so it'll be, it'll be slightly different. Um, hopefully more efficient is my goal. And then if you're interested in more events, as always, you can go on our website there and uh, look up what events are going on uh, all around the world now. Um, so it's great. Okay, so why are we all here? Um, well, uh, every so often consortium members will come to us and say, hey, I really, I really want to know how to do X or Y. Um, you, know, is there, you know, is there anybody in the community who's, who's really an expert on this? Um, that could, you know, help. And so if enough people come to us, we, we decide to hold a, a, a web meeting like this um, because it's a pretty efficient way of communicating uh, this kind of information. Um, so that happened this time. We actually had several people come to us and said they were interested. And, um, you know, they, they had done enough development with Ross and uh, had achieved enough that they were actually looking at deploying applications. Um, and so you know, this, this, becomes, this topic becomes very important if you want to put something out uh, on the factory floor or put out a product or, or what have you. There's three kind of sub-bullets here, right? Testing, um, which is really just exercising code paths by executing test cases. Um, and within ROS, there's a lot of uh, framework for this already. G-test, unit test, ROS test, ROS launch check. These are uh, great tools, but if you don't know they're there, um, you might not use them and you're missing out on, on, on the benefit. So I'm hoping that uh, um, at least uh, some people touch on these, and if not, I'll, I'll add in details, certainly. Um, continuous integration is uh, the next topic. Um, it's basically automated build and test for every software change. Um, and we for, 
for doing this, we use tools like Travis or Jenkins or uh, uh, Bitbucket. Basically, anytime somebody changes something, you build the software and you run all of your tests. And if that all succeeds, then that gives you some level of confidence that the, the change that was made didn't break anything. Um, this is actually very important when you're taking changes from around the world from people you don't necessarily know or have no experience with. Um, continuous integration is a very, uh, very powerful tool for, for giving you confidence. And then deployment. So this is kind of the last thing that happens, but it's the methods of installing robot software in, in whatever your production system is. Uh, this isn't something that a lot of people do. Um, as I mentioned, re, you know, I, I had hoped Rethink would, would really expand upon this, but uh, um, yeah, there, I know it will come up in some of the presentations. And so this is really important about how do you guarantee that whatever you, whatever software you built gets deployed in, in a standard way and in, in a traceable way so you know what's out there. And there are tools for that as well. Um, what I would say, though, is if you don't do these three things, then you don't really have production-ready code. Um, and, uh, you know, in industrial, you know, robotics and in particular integration, I'm not sure we did all these things, honestly. And, uh, you know, but as we're moving to ROS and more powerful programming environments, these things become readily available, and there's no reason not to use them, honestly. So. Okay, so before we get into our our, um, uh, our pre presenters, um, I just want to let you know that we will start a discourse topic uh, after the meeting. So once I have the video of the meeting, I'll post that on Ross Discourse, and uh, I'll I'll try and start some discussion topics, and um, we can basically continue these discussions long after this web meeting ends. And uh, that's what I look like. Just in case you wanted to know. Um, I'm going to bring up our, our presenter. Our first presenter is Tully Foote from OSRF, and uh, just remind all presenters that I'm going to hold you to your time. Um, so please, uh, please try and keep it between 10 and 15 minutes. Um, I know that's actually hard. Um, oh, there, John. Thank you. So I, John asked me to talk on continuous integration. I specifically focused on that because of the time limits. This is a for shortened version of what the presentation that Ro, uh, Dirk Thomas did at RossCon this year. Um, in particular, he covered what's available in build.ross.org, including continuous integration, package building, and API documentation generation. I'm specifically just going to focus on the uh, continuous integration since we have a time limit. At the high level, um, when you want to run continuous integration, you're going to clone the, clone the sources, get your dependencies, build it, test it, and continuing on, you would build packaging and run API documentation. We're only going to cover up through the testing of this for this time. So when we're putting this together, we want to, it's relatively simple. You want to install all your dependencies, make sure the job is in a clean state. And the way we do this is we use the Docker container so that every job is completely isolated and have no side effects from past instances and won't affect future instances. Uh, we also, for better isolation, we use CAC and make isolated. Uh, CAC and make is the most common tool. We're slowly transitioning to CAC and make isolated, or CAC and tools, uh, which also has an isolated paradigm. But on the build farm, we use CAC and make isolated. And to install the code, we make sure to run the installation step to make sure that things work. And then we generate uh, X unit type results, which can be plotted over time and recorded into your continuous integration framework. Uh, such as Jenkins and develop things. Uh, there are a couple of things that our current implementation does not cover well. Uh, one is that if you have multiple packages per repository, you end up with, um, you can conflate their dependencies, and we don't completely test the test versus build dependency dec declarations. So I mentioned CAC and make versus CAC and make isolated. Um, when you're testing, we strongly recommend CAC and make isolated. This will let you know whether or not you have some implicit dependencies that are not covered. If you would run isolated, you're much more likely to capture those. Um, you also don't have to worry quite as much about the exported targets and a couple of other CMake level things that can either interfere with your system. And one thing we do for clarity is on run the builds with 
only the J1. It's not as fast, but it ends up with a much cleaner console output, which is actually the most important thing um, so that people know what to debug when they get there. Now, what I'm talking about is mostly build up ROS.org. Uh, we run it as a centralized service. Um, it would be possible for you to do everything yourself, um, but it's a lot of work and uh, it's not as discoverable or as useful to the community. And you know that when you download from our servers, you're trusting us that we actually built it and that it's not, uh, you don't have to worry about verifying and trusting as many parties. This is not to say that you can't do it, especially if you, if some of these things are valuable and you want to do it on private repositories. Uh, I'll have more details later, but the, everything we do is open source and deployable. So it's not that you can't, but in general, having the community behind it is very valuable. The way we work, coordinate this is through the ROS distro file. Um, here are a couple of links and some examples of what the ROS distro looks like. If you've done any releases or anything to the ROS community, or of ROS packages, you will know what they look like. Um, but I'm not going to go into too much detail right now. So this is what a Devel job does. I mentioned this at a higher level earlier, um, but the most the flow is that in the top left you have your code repository, and by default, every hour we clone the build farm will clone your package or your repository and check if there's been any changes. If there have been changes, it will create a Docker instance, install your build dependencies, build your package, and then install everything and verify that everything works. If that works, it will then continue on, create a new Docker instance, install all the test dependencies, build the tests, run the tests, and generate your the XML output. That XML output will be fed into or well, Jenkins will pick up that XML output after Docker, is, the Docker execution is finished. And based on the package that XML, it will actually send an email to the maintainer of the package for which there is a warning or error. Um, if it passes, no emails are sent. It will also email people if the uh, job goes back to green and is happy. And we also, in addition to emailing the maintainers, we also email the anybody who has committed since the last stable release, or last stable commit. And this is valuable. This is, we've been doing this for a long time on the Ross Build Farm. Um, in the recent iteration, however, we've been able to add support for GitHub pull request builds. Uh, this is exactly the same job on the right, where it does the exact same build and install and test and generate the results. Um, but instead of sending the email out, it will comment on a GitHub pull request status. And instead of being polling the repository for changes every hour, uh, we register a, web, a GitHub webhook, which means that when you open the pull request, Jenkins will be notified and immediately run the build on the branch that you're working on and not on the main branch. There are a few limitations on the pull requests. Um, right now, we only support GitHub. And you have to either add ROS pull request builder to access to your repository, or you can actually set up the webhooks yourself manually um, if you don't want to give ROS pull request builder access to do that. You can do the same thing with other continuous integration providers, for example, Travis CI, but for any release package, we strongly recommend um, doing it on the main ROS build farm for consistency. So an important thing about continuous integration is it needs to be reproducible. And in particular, it needs to be reproducible locally so that you can debug it. Because uh, it's really very frustrating when you get an email from the build farm saying your package is failing this test. And if you run the test locally, it does not work. Or the test does not fail and it passes. So to make sure that that doesn't happen, the ROS build farm packages all have scripts that will run exactly that same build, test, install, build, uh, build, test, test, run tests, and check the results. This means that for any job that runs on the farm, you can reproduce it locally on your machine. And the other significant advantage of this is that you can actually run this on Travis or any other system where you want to run your continuous integration. You can actually get these same scripts that are very principled and install things 
from scratch exactly as declared in a standard way. As I mentioned, the, um, with the continuous integration is all based on a repository. Um, so if you have changes in multiple repositories, it's very hard to run completely automated continuous integration. To that end, um, we have another solution, which we call the pre-release job. And what you can do with a pre-release job is you can select a number of repositories indicated in blue here that you're, you want to test some version of. And then you say what packages they affect or might affect and you want to test against them, which are the green double circled ones. And the job will then take that and expand it to say, well, what are the, all the packages that are between the double circled green ones and the blue underlay ones and pull them from source because they're going to have to be built because they're building on top of the changed blue ones. And then it will backfill and say, what are all the dependencies of all the source packages, the blue and green, and fill in the rest of the packages from dependent uh, Debian packages. And this allows you to test across multiple repositories and against higher level packages. So for example, if you're running a release of ROS CPP uh, on a specific branch that would go into the blue, but then I want to test to make sure that Arbiz still works. I would declare that, and then it would fill in all the dependencies between ROS CPP and Arbiz from source using the default version upstream, and then it'll pull in all the dependencies of those ROS CPP, all the intermediate dependencies, as well as Arbiz, and install those from binary, and then run it. So just as a quick overview of some of the things we support, we support Ubuntu and Debian, we support AMD64, i386, ARM64, and ARMHF. We don't turn everything on by default. It both takes a lot of energy and resources on the build farm, and um, it also ends up with more emails than people actually care about. Uh, one of the things we work really hard is to not have false positive failures. That means people stop paying attention to alerts, and that's quite bad. We're also, we also have beginning support for RPMs, um, but we're not actually building anything yet. Uh, we love your support. Ross Industrial has supported us on running the build farm. And as I mentioned, uh, all of this is open source and deployable. Um, if you have different requirements, proprietary uh, repositories that you want to run continuation testing on, uh, you can do that. If you see the wiki.ross.org slash build farm or the Ross build farm repository on GitHub, there are instructions how to do that. Bosch and ClearPath have both been testing and deploying things. There's also a link here to Bosch's previous presentation at uh, RossCon from two years ago. If you want to actually make something happen very shortly, you can go, if your packages are in the Ross build farm, you can add a doc entry to make sure to generate the API docs. The source entry will turn on develop jobs by default. You can also turn on pull request building at the link I provided earlier. And then, of course, when you release packages, uh, they will go through the Debian build pipeline, which I've had to omit for timing. And if you do get emails from Jenkins, pay attention. And if not, ask, if you don't know what to do, ask questions. Uh, we can help you and make sure it doesn't keep emailing you and have you start ignoring all emails. Here's a couple of troubleshooting tips that Dirk put together. I'm not going to go over in detail for timing reasons. And thank you. If you want more information, that's a link to the GitHub repository, which is the main entry point for reproducing these builds, running them locally, or deploying your own build farm. Cool. Well, thank you, Tully. Uh, I think uh, th that was really helpful and informative, and uh, uh, I can just kind of reiterate uh, how useful this, this stuff is. We use it in Ross Industrial, and uh, kind of the level of support we get from the community when, when things don't work uh, is, has been really nice. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, but uh, I'd like to open up to questions. So if you have a question, you can either choose to unmute yourself or type it in the chat, and uh, we'll answer it there. So I, Tully, I'll, I'll ask you a question. Um, we also use Travis. Um, in Ross Industrial, uh, but we use our own script. So how uh, how many people use your build scripts but in Travis? Do you, do you know or do you have an idea? 
Uh, I don't really know. Um, the Ross Industrial is the primary one I know of using Travis at this point. Um, also, yeah. the moving community, um, though I think there's a non-trivial overlap on that this developer base. Okay, looks um, like uh, got a couple of questions. Can you see them, Tully? Yeah, I can see them. Um, publicly accessible repositories. The public, if you're using if you're using a deployed version of the ROS build farm on a or a private version, you don't need a public ROS distro fork. Uh, you may need to have special keys that are given to the given to the build farm. I believe we now support the HTTPS token based access. Uh, coverage question about coverage information from the unit test or ROS test. Uh, our CI integration does not currently uh, capture any coverage information. Um, what we'd love to do is have another um, extension to do coverage and collect coverage and aggregate it over time. I would actually suggest integrating that as a separate job that then uh, we'll report separately and not to cross the unit tests with the coverage. But definitely if we had a coverage engine, that could be integrated. Probably if somebody wanted to, to, to contribute something like that, uh, would they should they reach out to you first or, or Dirk or somebody at OSRF? Um, if you're interested in adding that, I'd suggest starting either a ticket to discuss it or a mailing list, something on the mailing list, uh, discourse probably. Um, but we definitely would love to have that. We, we spent a lot of time on the build farm getting it to the current state and reworking and making it deployable for everybody and have had to switch to other development priorities. Well, cool. I'm going to uh, and yeah, this confirmation that from Philip that um, you don't need to have uh, public Rust distro fork. All right, Isaac is is next. Thank you, Tully. I appreciate uh, you waking up early uh, with us. Uh, so next up is uh, Isaac Sayoto. Hello. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Isaac Saito. Um, I'm a co-founder of a uh, Torque. <laughs> Um, non-profit consultancy in Japan, um, and I'm also contributing to uh, industrial uh, ROS industrial project these days. So today I'm going to talk about industrial CI package. Uh, it's actually a, a ROS package. So um, as you just hear, uh, as you just heard, uh, Tali could explain about the ROS build, uh, build farm uh, feature about the continuous integration. Um, so um, I'm trying to. Um, I haven't, although I haven't prepared my material as to uh, specifically to uh, uh, clarify the difference between the, the feature that the Ross Field Farm provides, um, I'm going to try as much as possible. <clears throat> so, uh, just a quick uh, recap of why we uh, why the continuous integration is useful. So, um, just uh, there's a lot of concern during the development, uh, some of which is. Like for example, um, you want to stay. Uh, you want to keep the uh, system stable with their change you're adding. Uh, you don't want to break your system with the change, and then also make sure that the upstream packages change in the upstream doesn't break your system. Also, uh, technical debt is something uh, you really want to avoid. You want to find you want to find bugs or potential issues as early as possible. Fix them early instead of pro procrastinating and, and ending up with uh, more future work. So uh, th there could be uh, many more concerns depending on your roles, but the, uh, these two absolutely uh, you really want to avoid for sure. Uh, in order to make sure that your uh, that your change is not breaking your system, um, typically you can uh, you can run the, these three steps um, of building your software because you, obviously you don't want to make uh, you want to make sure that the software builds. <laughs> Also, you want to run the unit test and also the system test defined in your software. So you're really encouraged to define uh, these tests in your package, in your software. Also, you want to uh, check there is no issues on, upon the de uh, deployment and no installation. Running these uh, steps manually, apparently, uh, it's going to be really tedious, um, especially um, uh, <coughs> You have to you have to do these tasks on the clean environment to make sure that the uh, dependencies is fully uh, fully met. 
so that uh, your software is not relying on something that is only available on your machine. And also, if your software is supposed to uh, run on multiple multiple platforms, like various operating systems, for example, then then you have to, um, you have to uh, check you have to check all the all the possible combinations. So apparently, it's going to be really time taking. <coughs> So uh, there's absolutely no doubt that the uh, automating these steps is, is, is so beneficial. And that's where continuous integration comes in handy. Um, so continuous integration can be can be useful in basically in every development environment, but it, it becomes particularly crucial if you're using open source software, because open source software is, is subject to change 24-7 uh, throughout the year on Christmas Day or New Year's Eve. Or on the uh, like International Poetry Day, or not anything, any day, so nonstop. So uh, you never know, and and uh, you, you never know what change in the upstream could break your system. So it, it's just simply a good practice. <clears throat> like uh, Sean just um, mentioned in the very beginning, that it, it's if you're not integrating the uh, continuous integration and along with the other uh, methods. You're not really. Uh, sorry, I forgot what you what you exactly said, but the, uh, you're not really doing the development or something like that. So um, there are uh, several software uh, options. Uh, uh, there are a server op software as an option, oh, as well as a cloud based service option. Uh, server software runs on host machine that you have access to. Uh, you have a full control, you can run it whatever timing you want to, and then customize it however you want, as, as much as it, the feature is provided. And some, soft, some software like Jenkins uh, is known for having an extensive set of features so that um, you can get much more tailored for your product needs. Um, obvious downside of running a server software on your machine is, is you got to maintain them. Uh, you gotta maintain the the CI server software and also maintain uh, the uh, server machine itself. So uh, the cloud-based option uh, frees you from uh, setting up and maintaining the server and everything, and you can start using continuous integration immediately. Um, it's really up to your choice whether you use server software or cloud service. But looking at the last few years, the, uh, the service called Travis CI, which is run by Germany, uh, the company in Germany, uh, seems to be one of the most favorite options among Rust developers, as far as I can tell. <coughs> so uh, now we have software or service that we can uh, readily uh, readily use for. But still, um, we are roboticists, not not like IT guys. So um, uh, and, and, and even with a, a very nicely developed software, uh, there's still a learning curve. So uh, it takes time and it takes some uh, motivation. Um, and, and most likely you're exposed to some, some shell scripting and, and a lot of software actually um, provides uh, their own grammar. Um, so understandably, robotics engineers tend to uh, tend to push these tasks away and then just uh, stay away from using it, even though they uh, fully understand the importance of continuous integration. <coughs> Here it comes the, the industrial CI comes in very handy. The uh, idea is to reuse configuration for continuous integration system among uh, among uh, uh, among other repositories, so that the developers can be freed from maintaining continuous integration and let uh, and and focus their robotics work. Um, so it's basically a set of just a, a shell script configuration, and it can be run as uh, it can be run against actually the uh, um, um, ROS packages, not just the ROS industrial uh, packages. And it's originally a fork of the of the package called JSK Travis, which is uh, created by the JSK lab at the University of Tokyo. Um, so Travis CI is currently uh, intended as a primary um, target uh, platform. 
uh, but it can also be um, uh, extended uh, to uh, other CI software service with minimal uh, addition. Uh, ROS, Indigo, Jade, Kinetic are currently supported. And, and uh, Tully uh, briefly mentioned about the uh, pre-release testing. Um, it, it is very nice feature, and I totally agree with him. Especially when you're, uh, if your if your package is supposed to be uh, built, uh, uh, supposed to be uh, released under the ROS build farm. Uh, one um, minor problem that I found with the pre-release testing is that you have to uh, set up the Docker environment on your own on on machine, which doesn't take that long, but still could raise the um, the mental hard hurdle for for a busy robotics engineer. So industrial CI uh, enables you to run pre-release testing without uh, setting up anything at all. And um, as I said, uh, industrial CI can run uh, on cloud or or the local host, and it can be also integrated with your private repository. Uh, I know some uh, quite a few number of uh, private repositories are are utilizing it. Here's some uh, uh, a the minimum minimum example of the configuration that you need to add on your repository in order to use Industrial CI. Uh, as you see, it's less than ten lines of a file, and it's because of Travis CI um, targeted. Uh, the format is is also what the Travis CI uh, has defined. If you look at the the third third line from the bottom, uh, it's Git cloning the Industrial CI code into your CI server and at the, the line at the very bottom you just run a specific script and that's where the all the all the uh, continuous integration processes that are defined in the industrial CI get started uh, so this is the layout of the entire system while industrial CI works uh, with your repository and CI server uh, your repository sits on the left bottom um, this is where your software is maintained. On bottom right, uh, developers write code on the, on their own computers and then send them send them to the repository as a pull request or direct commit a direct commit, and then repository sends the request to the associated CI server or server or, or service to run CI jobs, which is at the top left, and then CI server fetches industrial CI by git cloning, as I explained in the uh, and, and run the certain script accordingly. So as I said, um, everything on your end can be private as long as the uh, CI server can access the GitHub repository where uh, industrial CI is maintained. Uh, so there were some questions about uh, the user base. Uh, it's hard to tell um, how many um, users or repositories are there to that uses industrial CI, uh, although there are some figures that I can get. So the, on the metrics page on the GitHub repository, um, there were uh, it says 153 uh, clones per day on an average over the month of January, and 100, 100 unique clones per day. But these figures are honestly don't really um, are not really meaningful to me. Well, at least I can tell there are there are some users, not zero. And also using the GitHub feed, the search feature, I uh, searched uh, the repository that mentioned about industrial CI, and then uh, there are 142 results. Uh, there are duplicates, but I went over them manu manually and then pruned some of them. Uh, and I would roughly say, uh, ru I would say roughly uh, more than 50 repository uh, are at least mentioning or using industrial CI. So there are other options, CI options, as a, um, obviously, and a ROS build farm, as Tally explained. <clears throat> so uh, I would say the biggest um, difference uh, might be a uh, uh, it, the industrial CI can, as I, as I explained, it can be used from the private repository. Um, so there was a question discussion just happened right now. So, um, but I'm. Unfortunately, I couldn't uh, hear that part clearly, so uh, someone may be able to um, appreciate if someone could clarify that later. But the uh, so far as I understand, industrial CI can be uh, uh, usable in a private repo, whereas Ross build farm needs to be, uh, you need to 
uh, register your repository information publicly somewhere. Um, uh, yeah. So. Okay, and there are some other resources available in the Roscon and, and slides. And I'd like to thank all the all the users who are giving feedback, and also uh, like, particularly like to thank Matthias from from Fraunhofer IPA, uh, who is now a co maintainer co maintaining the industrial CI, and 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 lastly Ross Industrial Project, who uh, gives me an opportunity to present and maintain this package. All right. Uh, any questions? That that was great. I think I appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll see if any questions come in. Um, and, you know, I did want to talk a little bit about in in the beginning when when you started this. Uh, one of the main reasons that I, I was interested is that it it integrated with Travis, which integrated with uh, GitHub pull requests. Uh, now that. Uh, now that uh, OSRF supports them as well, it's, it's a little bit less important, but uh, I will say that I use industrial CI across uh, my public and private repos, and uh, and I, I do it even though they're not formal ROS packages. And uh, so I think that's one benefit of industrial CI is that you basically enable Travis and, uh, and check in one script and you're you're off and running with uh, continuous integration. Well, oh, it looks like there's a couple questions for you. So, so well, Trent is asking about. Uh, let's see, uh, would you deploy capability and locally hosted GitLab repo? So he, he's basically saying if if he has to host everything locally, um, and he's using GitLab, uh, can. Can you use it? And it looks like Matthias is saying that GitLab support is planned soon. I, I would I would also add, Trent, that uh, you can actually deploy both Travis and GitHub uh, locally. Um, you have to pay for them at that point, um, but those are things you can do too. And then a lot of the scripts that uh, um, both Tully and Isaac presented are uh, uh, can be uh, can be used privately, I guess. We, we do this at Swery, um, at, or well, when I was at Compass Research, we did it. Uh, uh, can I briefly uh, mention about the, the Lost Build Farm? Sure. Uh, so um, there are other uh, differences, but, but first of all, I really uh, uh, recommend everyone, especially, as I said, uh, if they're planning to release the package through the Build Farm, they really uh, uh, encouraged to use the Ross Build Farm, the the service. Uh, the reason uh, there that the industrial CI is still valuable is um, other than the the private pu uh, public issues, uh, it's also customizable. You can customize the pre process, pro post process, and even uh, you can even add your your uh, customization to the main uh, script. And 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 also uh, if you're Particularly hosting your repository on the GitHub. Um, as far as I understand correctly, uh, GitHub has a one-hour uh, time limit for for each build, which and then and and Ross build farm tends to uh, take longer in my experience because it, and because it prioritizes accuracy over speed. So uh, that was actually a, a problem with the MoveIt project. So uh, because it, it builds. It builds takes forever, and then uh, we still uh, want to use the CI, so we ended up uh, having an, uh, their own uh, industrial, I uh, know, their own CI project. So, um, but still, uh, we like to. Uh, it would be ideal if we consult if we can consolidate the service so that the, uh, uh, we get the better support. So we will still look for the opportunity to uh, how we can uh, work, how we can contribute to the Rostrum farm and. Work with them. Awesome. All right. Thanks, I Thanks so much. We're gonna we're gonna move on to uh, uh, actually Ed, Ed Venator, but uh, um, is filling in for PJ Reed from Southwest Research. Uh, Ed, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Sean. 
Hi, I'm Ed Benator. I'm from Southwest Research Institute. Um, PJ prepared these slides. Philip Reed, he's one of my coworkers, and he's actually in chat today, but he is homesick with the flu and doesn't have a voice. So I'm going to be doing my best PJ impression. Um, the work we do is with autonomous vehicles, so full-size automotive scale robots. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do for testing CI and deployment. Uh, and hopefully I can fill some of the gaps on deployment that uh, we missed out on from Rethink today. Uh, so, a quick overview, I'm going to talk about continuous integration, uh, which uh, Tully covered wonderfully and uh, Isaac followed up with a lot of information, but I want to just touch on how we use it. Testing, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, and then I'm going to spend some time on deployment. Uh, we've tried several different methods for deploying code to vehicles from uh, sort of pure source deployments all the way up to our own build farm, so I'm going to spend some time on that. Uh, this is contact information for PJ Reed, who developed all these slides, and I would call our resident expert on CI and deployment systems. Isaac mentioned how uh, roboticists don't like CI. Uh, PJ is not a roboticist. Uh, he'll probably kill me for saying that, but he came out of software development, and he looked at our team and was horrified and whipped us into shape. He's still whipping us into shape. Um, and uh, any questions, he's in chat right now today, uh, and you can feel free to contact him. Uh, my contact information is not up here, but uh, I can post it in chat at the end of the presentation if anyone wants to get in touch with me. So continuous integration. There's a few options here. Um, one of them is industrial CI, which uh, Isaac just talked a lot about. Um, Another one, uh, GitLab CI, which actually came up as a question in the last presentation. We use GitLab internally for the same reason that Trent asked about it. Our corporate overlords do not believe that GitHub is a secure place to store anything. Uh, so we host everything on completely internal GitLab servers. GitLab is a product like uh, GitHub or uh, Bitbucket. It's a Git hosting service, except you can host it entirely locally. Uh, and it's, we, we find that it's a little bit better than the, the enterprise GitHub. Uh, but it also comes with its own CI solution. The CI solution that comes with GitLab is very similar to Travis. Both of them are very lightweight. They store the configuration in the repository. Uh, and we find that, as a result, they're a lot easier to configure and interact with than something like, say, Jenkins or TeamCity. Of course, the gold standard, which Tully talked about earlier, is the OSRF build farm. And if you're releasing packages publicly, then you know you can't get around using the OSRF build farm, and you shouldn't. It's the best and the authoritative way to test and release your your software. Um, one of the things that he touched on there is that it generates documentation, and this is one of the, the best features of it. Uh, if you have doxygenated code, and if you have any ROS messages in your package, all of the documentation on uh, ROS.org in the API documentation that's coming off the build farm. So it's sort of a free value add if you want to use the OSRF build farm. And we do have some 30 packages um, in our group that we release publicly on GitHub and build publicly on the OSRF build farm. Uh, so I'm going to jump into testing a little bit here. Uh, we don't do as much automated unit, unit testing as we should, and some of that is because automated unit tests don't work really well for a lot of the things we run into. Uh, unless we could set up a full hardware in the loop testing lab, a lot of the stuff that concerns us, we can't do automated, or at least we haven't figured out how. I know there are some really smart guys at companies like Fetch that are doing it, but our approach to this is manual testing is still infinitely better than no testing at all. Uh, so we run as many automated tests as we can, but we also expect that for significant changes, we'll test things manually. Uh, another option would be testing in a simulated environment like Gazebo. Um, and we, have, we work with some clients who do simulated testing in another simulation environment. It's incredibly valuable for them because they don't have access to the actual hardware we're working on. But you do run into some problems with simulated testing. Uh, the big one is there's a lot of overhead in setting up a test environment for specifically for outdoor robotics, which is what we do. Uh, setting up a test environment where all you care about is uh, I have a, an indoor environment and a robot on a planar surface is a lot less overhead than creating an entire gazebo world for a test track or an outdoor test environment. Uh, so we found that uh, getting that kind of environment set up for the, the kind of complex environments we work with is very difficult. 
But for a lot of people working in robotics, it's a really great solution so that you don't have to deal with hardware, you don't have to deal with potentially breaking things or safety problems, and also you can run Zebo in, in an automated fashion. Uh, but we don't have a lot of experience with it. So a lot of our testing, uh, because of the problems of safety and being able to test things repeatedly, being able to test things without uh, risking hardware or people, is bag files. Uh, we have a lot of bag files that we've generated over the past few years of doing ROS development. Uh, and if you have a, a bag file, then you have sort of the authority on what your robot is seeing and doing. So it, we find that it's really useful for debugging behaviors that haven't changed. Of course, you can't forward simulate the changes that you make, uh, but it's really good for simulating and testing perception. So if you can set up all of your, your uh, launch files to be able to run headless where they don't run any of your sensor drivers and just run a bag file in their place, and you create bag reporting scripts that store raw sensor data, then it's really easy to create a, a test pipeline where you go out, you collect a whole bunch of data, and then you can spend the next few weeks developing off of that data where you're running the actual vehicle software with the actual vehicle data, uh, but you've just sort of dropped the bag in as a, as a mock sensor. Uh, this is a quick plug for one of the things we've developed because of all of our, our bag testing. Um, PJ spent some time in the, the last year or two developing a web-based bag database server. Um, the basic concept of the bag database is if you have a lot of bags, you need a place to put them and you need a way to find ones that match what you need for what you're developing on. Uh, so for example, we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of bags and sometimes you need all the bags that contain images because you want to train a classification algorithm. Uh, so you can go through and grab all the bags that contain images by searching by topic. Or, for example, maybe you want to train a specific classification algorithm. Maybe you're working on something to identify pedestrians. If you tag those bags in the, the database server, uh, you could search by those tags. So if you co collect a whole bunch of bags containing pedestrians or no pedestrians, then you can use those bags as an input to your training algorithms or your testing. Uh, so that's just a quick plug for our bag database. Now, the thing I want to spend the most time on here is deployment, uh, partly because um, the, the guys from Rethink couldn't come today, partly because I feel like uh, Tully and Isaac really covered the, the CI part of, side of things really well. But uh, we do have a lot of experience with deployment, not as ex much experience as ClearPath or Rethink, but we have, so for some background, the work we do, we develop a lot of, almost exclusively, we develop software for clients. Uh, so the client comes to us with a problem, we work on the problem, we deliver the software. Uh, and so it's not a deployment problem of the scale that, say, ClearPath is working on or that Tully is working on, where they have hundreds of, of customers or a community of thousands. But it's a situation where we do need to deliver polished software that our clients can run without having us standing there telling them how to do it. So we've gone through a, a sort of evolution on this process. We started out with source on vehicle, and this is probably what 90% of Ross researchers are doing. Uh, you check out all your code on your vehicle, you build it on your vehicle, and then you run it on your vehicle. Uh, there's a few things about this that make it attractive and a lot of things about it that make it bad. So it's very simple to set up, which is why a lot of people, if you're doing a research project, if you're in grad school and you just need to make it work, this is what you go to. Uh, you're guaranteed that your code is going to run on your vehicle because it was built on the same architecture. You don't have to worry about that. But it's really difficult to coordinate. Once you have a team of more than one, uh, tablet coding on the vehicle becomes a real problem. Uh, and knowing what you ran on the vehicle becomes a real problem. So it's easy to lose track of changes. When we were using this method, and we used it for several years, it was common practice for someone to come in, notice that there was uncommitted code on the vehicle, and then not know what to do. So the fact that it's really fast sort of gets swamped by the fact that you could lose changes and that sometimes you're testing against code that you're not 100% sure it's the code you put there. Unless you completely wipe the vehicle when you come in every day, it's a really bad way to develop. Uh, so this is what we started out. Uh, and you can see in the, the diagram on the slide that uh, you have multiple people deploying to multiple vehicles, multiple computers on the vehicles. It can get really ugly real fast. So, okay, deploying source on vehicle, bad. From there, we moved on to sort of 
hybrid solution where we didn't want to set up a build farm because build farms are scary and hard. Uh, so instead, we came up with, actually, I came up with a, a script where you build everything on your developer machine using Catkin, uh, install it to an install space on your developer machine, and then sync that over to the vehicle. This is a little bit more work to set up, but it still allows you to very quickly iterate because you don't have to wait for a build farm to build something, build Debian's, install the Debian's, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the main advantage of this is it's very easy to keep track of the changes. Uh, the code that's running on the vehicle is always the code you just built. The code you just built is always on your developer machine. And so it makes it a lot easier to coordinate between multiple people because every time someone goes to run code on the machine, they've removed all of the other code that other people have run. Uh, disadvantage is, well, exactly the same thing. If you have multiple people developing at the same time on the same vehicle, uh, they're not going to be able to easily share their code between each other without coordinating externally, like committing it to GitHub and pulling and merging. Uh, so it does slow you down a little bit, but uh, we've found that it makes it much easier to determine the truth of the code on the vehicle, and so it's uh, a better method. Uh, one other advantage is if your vehicle computers are storage limited, uh, you are only putting your installed artifacts on the vehicle. So that means binaries, launch files, uh, configuration. You're not putting all your source code. Uh, so actually, I had to use this method on one of our projects because uh, the vehicle I was installing to didn't have space for all our source code. So deploying from source, still better than building on target, but still not as good as actually building software and distributing binaries. If you're going to be distributing your software to a client, you don't want to have to make them build the software themselves because then they have to maintain their own build environment, and most of your clients probably don't want to do that. Next step up, a single Debian package. You take all your software and put it on a build server or just build it on your own machine and put it into a single Debian. Uh, it's a little bit of work to set up, and depending on the size of your workspace, it can take a long time to produce, but it's really easy to track released versions. It's really easy to keep a history of released versions. And if you have a lot of repositories that are going into your release, then you've got all of them synchronized at one point in time. Uh, so one of the projects I work on has about 188 packages spread across a couple dozen repositories. Keeping all of those repositories in sync when you're deploying them to a vehicle is a real chore because you have to tag all of them, sync all the tags, make sure you check out all the right tags on the vehicle. It's a mess. So having a, a single Debian that just installs exactly what you want is a necessity in some cases. Uh, so this was our, our interim step before we took the plunge. So we are now running a full OSRF build farm locally at Swery that builds our code from our private uh, GitLab servers, generates Debian in the same manner that the OSRF build farm does, which is to say we have one for every package. Uh, it's a complex setup, but because of the work that Tully and the guys at OSRF have done, it's definitely doable. So PJ spent about a week setting up our build farm. Uh, we have one uh, virtual machine that's acting as the, the head of the build farm that runs the web interface. It's a Jenkins interface. I think most people here are probably familiar with it from the OSRF farm. Uh, and we have two or three... Uh, build slaves that are running on just VT computers around the lab. Uh, like I mentioned, we're running it entirely internally. Our ROS distro is hosted on GitLab. Our, all of our code is hosted on GitLab. Uh, and we use the same Bloom process that is used for publicly releasing. There's a, the only thing is at the end where it makes a pull request on GitHub. You don't want to do that. Uh, and there's no uh, way to automatically make those pull requests to GitLab, so you've got to do it manually. Other than that, it's entirely the same as releasing to the OSRF farm, uh, and you get the same output. So you get Debian's, source Debian's for every package. You can configure it for what architectures you care to build for. Uh, you get documentation. And so if you're looking to create uh, actual build products that you actually can distribute, uh, it's a really great option. Uh, and we actually, we've got it to the point now where we can go to a vehicle with a, a fresh Ubuntu install at our own, again, private app repository and install our, our full software stack from Debian's using apt-get, uh, which is huge for us. So it is a little bit of work, 
but it makes it a lot smoother to release. And the other advantage here is you're getting your own dog food. Uh, so the, the stuff that you're testing and you're working with is the stuff that you would be delivering to a client. So it's a, a really good way to make sure that, oh, you know, I actually did install everything. And when I give them a Debian, they're going to get the same thing that I've been testing with as opposed to my dev code, which runs differently because I built it on my laptop, or my dev packages, which are different because they don't have everything installed in the installed version. Uh, so I, I kind of flew through that. Um, this is my last slide. Uh, I, found, I got these slides yesterday, so I'm sort of flying by the seat of my pants. I'm going to open it up to questions. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer them. If not, TJ's in chat, and he can also answer any questions. Thanks, Ed. That was that was really good. I think that that covered a uh, a big hole in deployment, and uh, I certainly learned stuff that I didn't know. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over presentations, but uh, I know this was important to some of the the attendees, so. Uh, Unless you explained it perfectly, I hope they ask some questions. And if anyone has specific questions about what we had to do to set up our own build farm, um, I'm not the, the expert on that, but I'm sure PJ would be happy to answer those either online now or in an offline discussion. It looks like there are a couple of questions. Uh, I, oh, I've got a few questions here. So I've got a question from Adam. Uh, how did you ensure that packages built on your local machine correctly ran on the deployed systems? Uh, the answer is we did. Um, basically, uh, it, it was usually pretty obvious to us if packages built on the local machine didn't run on the deployed system. Uh, we were always running the same architecture between the, the deployment machine, the build machine and the deployed machine, which is key to that. Um, if you were running, say, uh, ARM on your, your actual robot and had an i7 on your computer, you'd have to set up a tool chain, which sounds like more trouble than I want to go through. Um, so we, we didn't have any particular method for, for making sure that things were running the same, uh, but we had pretty good faith because we were using the same architecture, the same uh, Linux distribution between the two. A uh, question from Isaac about Bag Database, asking if there's any plans to run a cloud service for it. Uh, we do not have plans at this time to run a cloud service for it, uh, but it is open source on GitHub and you can run it with Docker. It's pretty easy to set up, so, uh, and it's BSD, so if anyone else would like to run a cloud service for it, uh, be our guest. Uh, I believe there is also a company that is running a similar cloud service for bag hosting, bag searching, but I don't know anything about them. I think they gave a, a presentation at Roscon this year. Jeremy asks, uh, if you were trying Docker in your deployments, if true, can you talk a little about that? Uh, so we do not really use Docker in deployments on vehicles. We use Docker for build environments. So the OSRF farm uses Docker extensively for consistent build environments, as does GitLab CI. Uh, we have played with it a little for deployments on vehicle. Uh, PJ has done it more than I have. My experience is that Docker is really, really good at uh, running a service and minimally exposing it, and ROS was not designed for middle, minimally exposed services. So unless you run your entire ROS application, every node inside the same Docker container, setting up your network configuration is either a bit of a hassle or practically defeats the purpose of Docker. Uh, PJ just uh, made a comment on the BAG database cloud service. Uh, he said right now there's no authentication mechanism for the BAG database uh, because it was designed to be running inside our network. Uh, and before it could be used as a cloud service, that would be a feature to add. So, you know, pull request welcome. All right. I, I really appreciate that, Ed and, and PJ. Uh, PJ, I hope you, you get better. Um, but uh, these guys really, they, they've really done a, an amazing job. Uh, I've seen it work, and uh, they're, they're a great resource. So please, uh, people, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, our, our first, what we're calling lightning, lightning talks or discussions. And these are just quick five-minute presentations um, a couple people came to me and just wanted to uh, put some stuff out there for discussion. And uh, Jeremy Adams from Intelligrated uh, in particular was interested about uh, uh, mocking and ROS unit testing. So I, uh, I'll pass it off to you. Um, so really, um, you, you uh, kind of 
pull, stole my thunder a little bit because uh, that's almost entirely what my question is, is uh, the, the opening slide, but we'll go through these. Um, so my, my problem, <laughs> what's that? I said my apologies. Go ahead. That's okay. It's a lightning talk, right? So uh, my assumption is that most developers are writing, uh, and by developers I mean uh, ones that were commonly pulling uh, Debian packages from. So those using the ROS uh, build server and those outputs. And what my assumption is is that most of those are writing unit tests and or ROS tests. But um, it looks like from my inspection that they're not actually covering much of the code. And since we don't have a coverage tool, um, it's likely we, we don't really have the full uh, understanding. But, um, and then other developers who are using this, these uh, code bases, they may not be familiar with unit testing or, and or ROS testing, or they may not just use it at all and, and try to avoid the topic. So my, my kind of question is, why would you mock? And in the Ross answers, or sorry, Ross wiki, it talks about using a, a library and a, a library structure where you kind of make your library code agnostic to Ross, and then you unit test that and incorporate that into the rest of, of uh, ROS. Um, so I want to isolate uh, the ROS code, but I may have a I may have a package that's already been written, and I don't really want to really want to refactor it. So what I'm looking for is, you know, why where would if I we're going to write mocks, where would we write them? Where would we store them? Maybe we create them in the test directories for the ROS framework or the base packages, or maybe we um, incorporate those into Debian source files. I also noticed uh, that on ROS answers, there's been some discussion about using Google Mock, and the notations there are that Google Mock is not uh, does not work well. I'm not really understanding why, but it's not working well with Indigo. And that uh, now in Kinetic, I guess especially since it's it's on 16.04 uh, Ubuntu, that it works better. So that's where I'm kind of leaving it and wanting some feedback. So Jeremy, if if I understand Mock correctly, you you would create mocks for all the ROS API calls. And that would allow you to very efficiently run, instead of running ROS tests where you bring up a whole ROS system, you could run things that look like unit tests, which are lightweight and, and fast, but it, you, it would require mocking out all of the ROS API. Is that, is that what's really required? Well, I think in my understanding, especially with Google Mock, you can write a hybrid, uh, hybrid mock class and I don't know, I, I haven't read too much into that, but I think it's through inheritance um, and or uh, templating. So to answer your question, I don't think you'd have to mock out the entire ROS, you know, like every class that's written in the, in, in, for ROS, but I think okay. just what you're using. Now, the question could be, does the person writing the production code write the mock or does the person, you know, is it something that would be conveniently supplied by the developer of the API you're calling? And my, I think it's a little bit of both. So does that kind of answer your question about my question? No, it it, it helps. Uh, are you are you aware of anybody who's who's doing this? Like any ROS packages that are using Google Mock in general, not necessarily just you know for the ROS API. Um, it seems like from that last slide that if you look, if uh, I won't click on it here, but if you look at that question that some people have actually started using mocks, and especially in Kinetic, and um, I think that's the only use I've seen. I checked out like uh, probably a, a half a dozen or so different uh, Ross 
uh, GitHub repos and examined the unit test, and I didn't see any any use of GMock in the CMake uh, list.txt or in the code itself. Well, maybe maybe somebody out in the audience uh, who's more familiar with Google Mock and 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 unit testing can can chime in because I. I, I can tell you why nothing exists. It's because there are no tutorials and no examples of, of how to do it. Because as Isaac pointed out, most roboticists are not not a uh, you know not software developers necessarily. So if if anybody wants to chime in and uh, has some expertise here, that'd be appreciated. Sean, a bit on the this is totally, uh, a bit on the compatibility and the issues with deploying GMock is that GMock includes. Uh, version of gtest internally, which conflicts with the default version of gtest that we're deploying, uh, which is the problem with deploying it. Did that and, uh, in kinetic? I'm not sure exactly. I certainly know that was the problem with Indigo. I think it sounds like people have found workarounds for kinetic. I believe there's still an inherent issue that gmock is packaging gtest internally, and there's some CMA hoops that you have to jump through to detect if gmock is installed, you use the gmock gtest instead of the default gtest. So to your point about visibility or uh, best practices, I know that on the ROS uh, tutorial, or sorry, ROS wiki, there are a handful of uh, pages discussing, you know, writing good unit tests and why you should do it, but no real mention of mocking and, you know, as Tully just stated, um, there's, that's probably a good reason why, because of this conflict. But uh, going forward, it seems like some people are starting to solve that problem, and I'm wondering if uh, some tutorials and you know pushing that kind of best practices on the on the wiki would be helpful. Certainly, I think that'd be good. Python mo mocking's been going on in the Python unit testing for quite a while, but until GMock came along, there wasn't a good standard C++ one. Um, but now that it's hopefully available, it's good practice to use. Uh, one of the big differences between mocking is that it allows you to do integration tests that only have the dependencies of unit tests. Holly, do do you? I mean, do you see the value in, in doing that? Uh, like, is it? Is, are they lighter weights? Are they faster? You know, do do you see that value? Yeah, a mock test lets you isolate the. You say, okay, I expect the behavior of the rest of the system to this. Test only this system. Uh, greatly decreases your dependencies on the external systems when you want to run it, so you can actually run it as a unit test and say, I would expect to receive six messages in this order in this sequence, and the mock will provide that. And then you mm -hmm. you could test your unit on the unit under test is much smaller, and you don't get you don't get an issue that like if there's a bug in ROS UP and it something happens over there, it doesn't affect your test. Okay. Yeah, I think well, I, I was just thinking that the isolation that you mentioned uh, is is all the reason for both sides of the equation: people writing APIs and people uh, using the APIs to start trying to develop mock frameworks. I guess the real question here is is how to construct it and get around this this conflict between gtest and gmock, and also where to store the mock. Uh, headers when we're done. What's the best practice there? Yeah. So, Jeremy, I I, I do think the the build issue is going to be uh, that's going to be hard, right? You got we're going to have to to work around it. But I will say just from experience, once you create a tutorial, it's amazing like how how that can kind of jumpstart or kickstart uh, the the development that that you want or need. Um, and at the very least, it, it kind of uh, transfers the knowledge to uh, to people. And like I said, since we're not software developers, when it comes to testing, that the knowledge transfer is is kind of critical. So yeah, any any other last items before we we move on to Florian's talk? I don't have any. I just look to the discourse to continue the conversation. And I'll I'll be sending that out. Uh, Probably uh, within the day with the recording of the the, uh, the web meeting. All right. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I really uh, appreciate all the the work you've you put in and behind the scenes and uh, 
and in your presentation. I appreciate it. No problem. All right, Florian. Last but certainly not least. Okay, thanks, Sean. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you great. Okay, very good. Uh, so another short lightning talk about uh, yeah the automated test framework we've developed. Uh, so yeah, as you all know, there is a wide range of distributed observed elements going on in the Rust community. So that means that information about a Rust package is spread in the Rust wiki, in source code dot uh, but also in expert knowledge, direct contact mailing list, or Rust answers. And there is already some tools in ROS for measuring code quality. So first of all, of course, the OSF build farm, which does a good uh, job uh, on compiling and yeah, running unit tests. Uh, but the unit tests mainly depend on the package maintainer. So there's for sure packages which have a good coverage, but there's also a lot of packages uh, which have a very poor test coverage. There's also things like the ROS industrial rating system, uh, which is based on the wiki, but that's also at the moment a manual uh, effort with labeling that. Uh, there is also tools like GitHub and ROS index, which gives you an, a hint of how active a package is still maintained or developed, but there's no objective measure for the runtime behavior on, on a high level point of view. The problem a developer focuses is uh, how can I select a component which fits best to uh, uh, the other components I'm using, to my robot, to my environment, to my infrastructure? Uh, so that's due to the reason that you can you know, have the same ROS package with a slightly different configuration, doing something completely different, or having uh, multiple packages offering same functionality, like different drivers for the same hardware piece of hardware, or different path banners for like moving a mobile base somewhere. And if you sum up all that and have just a small uh, variation, you easily end up in more than thousands or even tens of thousands of uh, test cases, which is of course impossible to, to test and also to uh, compare afterwards. Uh, so we feel there is a need for a quality measure on the runtime behavior, uh, which has some yeah, objective testing, which means if I am in the place of selecting a path banner for my mobile robot, I'd like to have some assistance to choose which path banner is the best for my application or which configuration set uh, fits best to my, my robot and my application. So what we have developed is an automatic testing benchmarking framework, uh, which generates performance indicators uh, using common metrics on the ROS API level. What does this framework offer? It offers a continuous integration service that so can either run uh, on a Jenkins build farm or on Travis, uh, and especially can be run as a hardware in the loop or simulation in the loop uh, test system. It already offers uh, building blocks for gathering uh, data on system level, like CPU, RAM uh, usage of a node, or of a deployed ROS, work, ROS network out of multiple nodes, uh, all the things like update frequency or publishing frequency of a topic, and all the TF tracking of frames and so on. The third thing it offers, it offers like a benchmarking uh, tool set. So if you have a widely used ROS interface like MoveBase interface or Move Group from MoveIt, there can be a metric which already evaluates like execution time, accuracy, pass length, and so on. So you can easily compare different uh, move base instances uh, with each other, like combination of path planner localization uh, and different configuration. That's all composed out of the, yeah, or based on a, a CI server. And then on top of that, you either connect to a real hardware, you connect to a simulation if that's available. If both is not available, then you can still uh, work on recorded data, as we heard in the previous talk about the, the vehicle. Um, and we might even need to add uh, another block here for mock-up components. So if you have neither hardware, nor simulation, nor recorded data, so you might just uh, want to mock some uh, ROS interfaces uh, to continue the test of the application. And then on top of that, there's a web-based evaluation analysis tool which lets you compare the different uh, test cases 
we need to add that. So that's just a very short uh, example uh, how that comparison could look like. So you test different uh, combinations of robot-specific, environment-specific, and application-specific uh, configuration, and then it's easy to judge or to, to select the component which fits best uh, to that specific combination. So as a summary, uh, the goal was to enhance the transparency of the component quality in the distributed open source development, uh, which takes, uh, yeah, which makes use of metrics which can be gathered from runtime performance of a deployed ROS system, uh, which helps the user to list select uh, a component or a component configuration set uh, for his application. So the solution is an automatic test framework, which is available uh, open source. So you are welcome to try that out. Uh, we are currently hosting a workshop in Stuttgart. Uh, we will drive into that tomorrow and see how we can use that and apply it to different use cases. Thank you. Thanks, Florian. Uh, that that is. Uh, I, I realize there's a lot there that you packed in the five minutes. Uh, we'll see yeah. if uh, anybody has any questions. But uh, I assume you you've done you've used you've used this on some combination of hardware and simulation uh, at EPA. Is is that true? Exactly. So the the the, the goal was to uh, not only test uh, on a CI server, but also to include like a really deployed system, like uh, a robot with multiple machines involved and really the deployed ROS configuration. So you can easily evaluate if like network or CPU load is spread in a good way on your system or which kind of combination makes your path planner uh, generate better paths and let the robot arrive earlier at the goal. Okay. By the way, I just I just looked up your uh, your GitHub site. It it has a lot of really good documentation for for helping deploy. Um, since this, uh, there are a lot of pieces to this, so that's that's really good. I appreciate that. Um, do you do you intend on uh, doing more development, or is this kind of a, a done thing? And now you're just going to use it. Uh, for other at, at the moment, it's a, I would call it a proof of concept implementation. So it has been used in uh, a variety of use cases, but it's not spread out to the to a wider audience yet. Uh, but if that's uh, if you figure out that's useful, then we will also continue uh, development for that. So I, I guess if you had to, in kind of a couple of sentences, say. Uh, What's the main value you get from using uh, ATF uh, above and beyond some of the other tools people have developed? I guess can you can you kind of summarize that real at mm -hmm. a high level? So the main purpose of the ATF, as it is implemented now, is to get um, metrics, met, met, uh, data from metrics, which describe the behavior of your application. An application meaning a deployed system on on a real target combining uh, different ROS nodes. Uh, so the same system as you would deploy to a customer. So you can directly test there and uh, yeah compare different configuration sets. It looks like Heish has a comment. Can you see that? Uh, in multiple scenarios, yeah. So you have the possibility to specify robot-specific uh, configuration sets, environment-specific, and application-specific environment sets. And this would allow you to uh, yeah, test the uh, same robot in different environments and check how the path planner uh, can deal with different uh, maps, different environments, for example. Yeah, so Kais was one of the first, very first users of that. Cool. Well, PJ and, and Ed, this uh, this may be something you want to look at for uh, for vehicle testing. Uh, and Florian, do you think it it might it would be useful for that? Oh, I've already started the GitHub repository. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So it provides all you need to replay back files and then specify your uh, 
test cases and get the metrics out of it. So I'm, I'm positive that you can apply that to vehicles. Yes. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate, uh, uh, Florian, I appreciate you putting that together. And I know the time was short, so I would encourage anybody who has more questions to, to follow up uh, with you uh, offline. And uh, yeah, um, so Florian was, was our last presenter, so we're kind of at the end. Um, I don't have much to add. Um, I'm not an expert in the space, so I certainly appreciate uh, everybody else lending their expertise. Um, I will send out a email to every all the participants with the recording, and uh, we'll continue this discussion on discourse. And uh, yeah, just thanks everybody for uh, participating. And that'll that'll be it for now. Thanks for your time.